<clears throat> I grew up in a world that was just a wee bit intolerant. <laughs> Yet secretly I knew in my heart that life could be about the passions of the heart. When I was 11 years old on a family sledding trip at Snoqualmie Pass, Washington, I discovered the joy of sliding downhill in the dripping rain <laughs> on my mother's 1927 pair of skis. It was in that moment <clears throat> that I knew the future of my life would be in the world of skiing. <clears throat> After two years of teaching kids for the Bellevue Public Ski School, I hitchhiked to Sun Valley, Idaho with the dream of becoming a professional skier. At the age of 18, I became the youngest ski instructor ever hired to teach full-time on Siggy Engel's legendary Sun Valley Ski School staff. <clears throat> Not satisfied with being just a ski instructor, in the spring of 1964, I became one of the first Americans to develop high-flying front layout somersaults on 210-centimeter skis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no kidding. <clears throat> but during the learning process <clears throat> in the spring of 1964, I missed landing a jump in Mammoth Mountain, California, and snapped off both bones at the boot top of my left leg. I returned, recovered, and began to teach skiing in Sun Valley again, but the leg had not healed properly and broke again in the spring of 1965. <clears throat> after, even after that second fracture, well told, I would never ski again within six months. The leg had healed fully, and I'd ventured off with a couple of ski buddies to New Zealand to teach skiing on the South Island. It was the adventure of a lifetime. <clears throat> I returned from six months in New Zealand. That next winter be became very exciting. I began teaching private lessons to dignitaries like Joan Kennedy, and actor James Carner's wife, Gim. Along with getting to meet and spend time with folks like Steve McQueen and James Arness. But more importantly, the media became, began paying attention to the radical new skiing techniques that I was introducing to the American public. And I soon found myself becoming a technical, ed technical editor for both ski and skiing magazines. And soon, I became a focus for the cover of magazines. My cachet with the ski industry began to rise rapidly. Before too long, I was um, skiing for major ski manufacturers, which was every professional skier's dream. And the paychecks were not too bad either. <clears throat> In 1972, I joined the marketing department of Snowbird, Utah as director of skiing, and that set the stage for an incredible series of international travels. During those years, I was also performing on rolling ski decks and ski shows around the country, here mimicking the antics of a beginning skier before crowds as large as 5,000 in New York City and other major cities. The breakthrough in my skiing career came in 1974 when I was asked by French Olympic champion Annie Famos to help produce, direct, and perform in the Marlboro Aerial Acrobatic Ski Show before audiences around the planet, including France, Switzerland, Italy, Finland, and Japan, and even Iran. For the next six years, all around the planet, living each day became a matter of living life upside down. It, <laughs> yeah, it was incredibly thrilling as it was dangerous. 
the opportunity to work with people from all different cultures and religions was totally eye-opening and a true blessing to find out what it was to be a human being on this planet. In 1978, filmmaker Dick Barrymore um, asked me to ski f heli ski for his cameras in Canada and Alaska. There is nothing sweeter than getting on board a jet helicopter to ski for cameras and getting well paid for such outrageous fun. <laughs> what, what else could you ask for? <laughs> 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 it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> but one morning in the spring of 1985, I awakened to the realization that I had been sidestepping deadly avalanches, plane and helicopter crashes, as well as deadly crashes on skis for way too long. And like a cat with nine lives, my number might come up before too long. I really did feel that. So, I retired myself. From the high adrenaline of skiing and devoted myself to a career in the creative arts including acting, writing, film production, and oil painting. Well, the adrenaline isn't there. The devotion to the fine arts can be even more demanding than was my career in skiing. When you are doing what you truly love to do, the passions of their heart bring extreme highs along with its share of challenges. But the love of what you're doing tells you quitting is not an option. I know of no better way to live than to love what you're doing in life through following the passions of your art. Thank you. Thank you.